So uh, today is Monday, February 22nd, uh, t is the 12.30 section. Our uh, recording for the section is on. Uh, today, I am uh, very pleased to welcome our guests from Bloomberg, who are going to be here all section long. And what they're going to be doing is, is Jordan's going to kick off, and I'll let her introduce our team in just a minute, with uh, some recruiting opportunities uh, for Bloomberg. Uh, and those are something you definitely want to try and take advantage of because this is the team that manages the, the recruiting relationship here with Maryland. Then the rest of the session is going to be really focused on some advanced terminal training uh, to kind of pick up uh, with some of the things we're doing and, and take us a lot further in some of the equity features of the terminal. Uh, I have to say I, I sat through this during the 11 a.m. section and learned a few tips and tricks myself. So very excited to, to hear some of the things that uh, Jordan and her team are going to share with us. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over uh, to Jordan for the rest of our class. So Jordan, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, so excited to be here um, with all of you. Um, we've had the pleasure of visiting this class um, over the years, and it's always such a pleasure to interact with Maryland students. Um, so um, we will start off with just a little bit of information about Bloomberg as a company, um, talk about what our entry level internship jobs look like, whether you're on the hunt or might be in a year or so. Um, and then I will turn it over to um, Freya and Maya, who I'll have introduced themselves in a second, um, to go through some really exciting terminal functionality and do that advanced training. So just to introduce ourselves, my name is Jordan. I am a campus recruiter. Um, I have the pleasure of working very closely with the University of Maryland and the Smith School uh, to bring Terps to Bloomberg. Um, we have a huge Maryland alumni base at the company, um, so we're always looking for more um, talented folks to join. Um, and then I'm, I'm joined today by Freya and Maya, um, who both have really interesting roles, um, joined Bloomberg after or shortly after uh, graduating from school as well. So have had that kind of entry level experience too. Um, so I'll turn it over to Freya and then Maya to introduce themselves and their teams. Awesome, cool. Thanks, Jordan. Hey guys, uh, my name is Freya. I graduated Maryland spring of 2018. So I can't believe it's almost been three years. Time goes by really fast. Um, but I've been at Bloomberg ever since I graduated. I started out as a data analyst in the global data department. Um, and now I'm actually in our financial products and sales department. So I work as an account manager. I cover, I'm on a regional buy side team. So that means that I cover like small RIAs, pension funds, uh, insurance companies, uh, endowment funds, things like that in the Southeast. So I cover parts of Florida. Um, I have all of Tennessee and all of South Carolina. So I work with all of our clients there. And really my job is just to, you know, make sure that they're getting the best out of their terminal usage, um, as well as showcase any sort of new functionality and new products to them as well. Um, so yeah, Maya, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I did not go to UMD, but I went close by in DC to the George Washington University. Um, I graduated in 2018 and actually started my career at a consulting firm in DC before joining Bloomberg about a year and a half ago. Um, my role at Bloomberg is an equity research data analyst, so I work closely with our Bloomberg intelligence team, um, building out company models and writing research. Um, so I'm on the equity side and I cover transportation and logistics, so like UPS, FedEx, um, all the North American and Canadian railroads, um, and trucking companies as well. Awesome, thank you both. And um, you'll get to hear a lot from Maya and Freya in just a little bit here. Um, and they'll show you a lot of the work that they're doing and things that can be really impactful uh, to you in the classroom as well. So let's talk a little bit about Bloomberg as a company. Um, you may be familiar with Bloomberg, of course, having used the terminal. Um, you may not know this, but Maryland actually has the largest university uh, terminal lab in the Americas. Um, I think there may be one campus in Asia uh, that is beating you all, so maybe we'll rectify that someday, but um, you all have a ton of access to Bloomberg and to terminals, and so we're excited to share with you um, about the company and what we do here as well. Um, so we were founded to bring transparency to the financial markets. Um, if you know anything about the history of finance, of bond trading, stock trading, um, it is not a place that was historically transparent. You were really relying on old data, kind of depended on who you knew when you called them and what they decided to tell you. 
Um, so our CEO and founder, Mike Bloomberg, uh, realized there's an opportunity for technology to come into the space. And that's how the Bloomberg Terminal was born. Um, so of course we're known for financial data, um, also known very well in the media world. Um, you might be familiar with Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Business Week, Bloomberg Podcasts, Bloomberg Quick Take on Twitter, um, a lot of different outlets there as well. And really what we are here to do is to democratize data, to provide transparency, access, um, to manage the data that moves the markets. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about who our clients are, what that looks like, um, and of course, you've got exposure to the terminal and you've already seen, you know, there's a million different ways to do a million different things. So many different types of people and key players that can benefit from this tool. Um, so that's what we were founded on and that's what we are still doing today, uh, many years later. So um, as you are all familiar with, I don't have to tell you too much detail about the terminal, um, but the terminal is our flagship product. Um, this is really the gold standard in the finance industry. There is nothing else like the terminal. Um, there are a couple things out there that also provide financial data and they do uh, do things for folks there, but um, the terminal is really the only place where you can get the breadth of data, of analysis, of intelligence, of quality um, anywhere else. Um, in terms of our client base, we have 330,000 clients worldwide. Um, so these are folks that subscribe to the terminal that are using these services for a lot of different things. Um, they might be portfolio managers, they might be risk analysts, they might be individuals who want to manage their portfolios on the terminal. Um, there's a lot of different people um, and types of people who can use this product. Uh, with our employee uh, footprint, we've got about 20,000 employees in just under 200 offices across the globe in over 70 countries. Um, so it's a truly global company. Um, and you kind of get the best of both worlds where we have this global reach and expansion, uh, but it's not a massive, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, thousands of people working for a company. Um, no harm in that, but I think it really lends itself to being, uh, to Bloomberg being a very communal atmosphere and you kind of get that um, you know, close feeling without that giant corporation, but you still have that global reach. Um, in terms of who we serve, so of course, um, we're known in the finance world. Um, if you work in finance, it's very hard to do your work without a terminal. If you're trading or managing portfolios, you need this tool, but we also work with a lot of other industries. So um, we have products for government professionals. That's actually how I got my start, uh, working with our clients in DC um, who use our uh, terminal data for legislative reasons, for understanding how to sell to the government. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that people can use this. Uh, tax and accounting professionals, legal professionals, uh, corporations, there's tons of people, you know, really anyone who can use data can benefit from using a Bloomberg terminal. At Bloomberg, we like to say we work on purpose. Um, Bloomberg is a very dynamic environment, very innovative, fast paced, and it's all about real work. Right? We are not big on busy work. We're not big on um, just doing things for the sake of doing them. Everything kind of has that end purpose. Um, so we work at what we call a smart speed because we have to. The market necessitates it. Our clients need it. Um, so it's a place where you'll work really closely with other people, work on a lot of different teams, grow your career in a lot of different ways. Um, and so there's a lot of different opportunity um, at Bloomberg. Something that the company is really um, insistent about is impact. So whether you are an intern or an executive or anywhere in between, um, you are empowered to make an impact. Um, so what we love to see in our interviews are people who come in and say, I have this creative idea. I've done this really innovative thing in the past. I have a way that we can do something better, do something faster. Um, that is our bread and butter. That's music to our ears. Um, so it's not a place where we do things because that's how we've done them. We constantly want to disrupt ourselves to innovate our own processes. Um, so you're very encouraged to do that really at any level. Um, of course, we're not in the office right now as it's not yet safe to do so, um, but our offices are um, really open. Um, no one at Bloomberg has a physical office. So Mike Bloomberg's desk is the same size as my desk. Um, if you ever visit us in our New York City office, he sits on the fifth floor. He's always down for a fist bump. Um, and as employees, whenever we run into him, he's always like, who are you? Who do you work for? What you do? Like really wants to get to know everyone. Um, and it just kind of, you know, lends itself to this culture of not really having that hierarchy. Um, it's not about, you know, who's got the corner office, who's a senior manager, who's a junior analyst or whatever that means. We don't really have those types of job titles. 
it's more about what you contribute to a project, what you bring to your team. Um, so it's definitely a bit different from a lot of other corporate structures, but it really allows you to grow in ways that actually fit your skill set and aren't just about titles. So talking about our people at Bloomberg, um, the first thing we always like to talk about is career development. So career development at Bloomberg, again, doesn't look very similar to maybe a lot of other corporate structures. Um, career development at Bloomberg is really about your skill set, what you want to do, what you're good at, um, and what's interesting to you. So as I mentioned, I was an account manager working with our government clients, and I went into a recruiting role, which is something that I had a background in, um, but it wasn't necessarily, you know, a really linear move. Um, but through, you know, the support of my managers, networking, I found the opportunity that was just right for me. And that's something that's really encouraged at the company. Um, so even though, you know, we don't maybe emphasize job titles or levels quite as much, you know, you don't start as like a junior associate and then move up the ranks that way. There's always opportunity to take on more responsibility, make more money, become a leader, work on different teams, work with different people. Um, that's really, really encouraged. Something that is really important to us at the company is diversity and inclusion, um, as well as just fostering a sense of equity and belonging. So in the recruiting process, we really want to see people who have different backgrounds, different experiences. Um, you know, it's not about what you majored in or where you went to school or the classes you took. It's about the skills you have, your drive to learn and your creativity. Um, so of course, you know, there are some skills you'll want to have coming into Bloomberg. Um, but it's less about that and more about what can you learn here? How can you grow? Once you're at the company, um, we have a lot of different ways that we support um, sort of that sense of diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. Uh, first is through our communities, which are essentially our employee resources, employee resource groups. Um, and we've got communities for all different types of identities and experiences. We have our Black professionals community, Latinx community, uh, Be Proud, our LGBTQ community, our military and vets community, Pan-Asian community, women's community, working families community. Um, there's a ton of things to get involved in, no matter um, what your identity is, whether you want to become a better ally uh, to certain groups um, or just kind of grow and network. Um, so these groups do all different types of events, community service. Um, really just intentional work to bring people together and kind of foster that sense of belonging. Um, something that Bloomberg also really highly prioritizes is well-being in and outside of the office. So Bloomberg has really fantastic benefits. They pay for all employees' health care, um, have a lot of resources, especially for working families, um, especially as we've you know, been virtual, they provided a lot of resources around mental health, resiliency, um, how to work when you've got kids at home and your whole world is upside down. Um, we also have on-site wellness centers. Uh, we do blood drives, uh, flu shots, um, and actually recently increased our parental leave to six months, which one is one of the longest in the United States. Um, so there is a lot of um, really incredible work being done just to support our employees and their well-being. And then when it comes to professional development, that's also something the company takes really seriously. So we have this uh, huge platform called Bloomberg University internally, um, where you can take classes on a ton of different things. There's financial market classes, coding courses, presentation, tons of different stuff. Um, and we also offer really generous tuition reimbursement for anyone who wants to sit for the CFA, do a data boot camp, get some sort of certification, get their master's degree or their MBA. Um, we offer that as well um, because Bloomberg really focuses on trying to grow people personally and professionally. One thing I always love to touch on is Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, so Bloomberg Philanthropies is our in-house foundation and they do a ton of amazing work um, with government, education, public health, arts and culture, um, serving a lot of different communities worldwide. Um, something that's really exciting about the work that Bloomberg Philanthropies is doing is that it comes from the company. Um, it's our in-house foundation. So every year, um, this is our in our business model, 85% of our profits go into community service work. Um, so we're still keeping the lights on, we're all employed, um, but 85% of our profits, I'll tell you, is a lot of money. Um, that's going directly back into the work we're doing for communities. So everyone at Bloomberg is a part of that in some way because we all work here. We all, you know, help with um, internal things, with clients, we're all helping to continue our business. Um, so everyone really contributes in some way, which is really, really powerful. 
um, especially this past year, Bloomberg Philanthropies has done a ton of work with um, Johns Hopkins, with the states of New York and New Jersey, as it relates to COVID-19. Um, they've developed some amazing contact tracing apps, um, done a lot of really cool work um, in that space. So that's been really exciting to see uh, internally. Um, we also have a community service program called uh, Best of Bloomberg. We call it Bob internally, um, so not a person, but we do have people named Bob at the company. Um, but the Best of Bloomberg is an organization within Bloomberg that um, provides community service opportunities, um, provides different types of philanthropy matching. Um, we have a program called Dollars for Your Hours, where if you do 25 hours of service in a year, they'll donate $2,500 in your name to an organization of your choice. If you do 50 hours, they'll donate 5,000. If you refer a friend um, and that person gets the job, they'll donate 2,500. Um, so they really make it as easy as possible doing things you are already going to do um, to be involved in charitable giving and community service. Uh, I believe last year, 93% of our employees were involved directly in some sort of DNI or philanthropic effort um, beyond the fact that we're all involved in the money that goes back into community service. Um, so it's something that the company takes very seriously. I encourage you to visit us online at Bloomberg.org um, to learn more. It's very kind of intrinsic to our culture um, and something that is important to all of us. So now let's talk about jobs. Um, so up here, I won't read through all of these exactly, but um, we do have a few departments that we hire for at the entry level. Um, so think, you know, internships, entry level full-time jobs. Um, the first department I always like to touch on is our analytics and sales department. Uh, this is the department that Freya works in. And this department um, is really fantastic to kind of come to Bloomberg. You go through a ton of training on the terminal, how we interact with clients and end up in a client facing role. So if you're interested in account management, sales, marketing, customer training, business analytics, things like that, is a, it's a really fantastic place to start to understand how are people in the market using this product and how do we manage those relationships. Then we have Bloomberg customer support. Um, so we have 24 seven customer support staffed by real human people. Um, so if you ever call Bloomberg um, at any time of day or night, you will get a real life person in um, one country or another. Um, and these are folks who are working with our clients to help them figure out any issues they might have on the terminal. Um, so this is a place, you know, if you're excited about problem solving, if you are really good at, um, I know I'm the person in my family, I'm always providing tech support, even though I'm probably not equipped to do so. Um, if you like digging into those types of problems, this is a really fantastic department to start in. Um, our global data department, that is where Maya works, um, and that department is really at the intersection of finance and technology. Um, so, you know, we're looking for people that are interested in working with financial data and have some level of coding or programming ability um, in things like SQL, Python, RStudio, Tableau, um, to be able to manage the data and drive the data that moves the markets. So we're responsible for managing all that data on the terminal, making it actionable, getting it into our clients' hands. Um, so if you're someone interested in sort of the tech side of things, this is a really fantastic place to start. And then of course, our news department. So if you have experience with financial journalism, business writing, um, interested in covering companies, things like that, um, there are some great news opportunities as well. In terms of who we look for at Bloomberg, um, we always like to see people that are interested in finance, of course, you don't have to be an expert in the markets, um, but having an interest, coursework, um, all of the recruiters at Bloomberg are familiar with this class, so we love to see uh, 443 on your resume. Um, that shows us that you've got a good understanding, of course, of the terminal and of the markets. Um, in terms of, you know, extracurriculars, we'd love to see people who are involved on campus, who um, have worked with groups, whether that's in the classroom, in a club, have worked on projects, who are effective communicators, um, who are excited about problem solving, who are creative, um, that can bring something different to the table. Um, in terms of technology skills, for most of our roles, we're just looking for a proficiency in Excel. If you have exposure to any other type of stat software, that's great to see, um, except for our data roles, which we are looking for that level of technical ability as well. In terms of what we're hiring for, um, while most of our hiring does happen in the fall, um, kind of during that heavy recruiting career fair season, um, we do have positions that are posted on Hiresmith. 
Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, we are looking for folks for some of our internships, full-time opportunities, um, and we are opening up applications for our sophomore externship as well. Um, so I know that was a lot in just a few minutes, but hope that hope that gives you um, kind of a sense of who we are at Bloomberg, who we are as a company, what we value. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end, um, anything related to the recruiting process or anything else. Um, without further ado, I wanna make sure we have a lot of time for Freya and Maya um, to talk through the terminal. Um, so Freya, I will turn it over to you to start. Perfect, thanks Jordan. Um, like Jordan said, uh, Maya and I will kind of go through um, a lot of different tools that you guys can use on Bloomberg to help you with different projects um, and assignments that you are working on. I unfortunately actually have to hop off in 10 minutes for like a work call. So Maya will cover me with anything that I don't get to cover with you all. Um, but the way that we kind of want to start this off is to first kind of show you different tools that you guys can use to uh, keep track of your portfolio. Um, I know that you all are currently using the idea function and team message, but there are also so many different cool tools for you to keep track of research and news and other analytics for your portfolio. So I'll showcase some tools in that aspect. And then Maya is going to go through um, a lot of equity focused tools. Um, doing equity screening is something that she's going to cover, looking at fundamentals um, and a lot more. Then we'll finish off, you know, talking about charting and the different kind of overlays you can use on a Bloomberg chart, which is really cool. And also touch base with some general news functions that you all can take advantage of. So that's what the schedule looks like. If anyone has questions, feel free to type into the chat or unmute yourself. And we'll also try to finish a few minutes early so that we have time for questions at the end. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you all can see my terminal panel. Um, and I wanted to go through a couple of different things. Um, the first thing that I wanted to cover is going to be keeping track of research for your portfolio. We have a function called RES. Res, R-E-S, you can type that in the command line, hit enter, and this is going to be our Bloomberg Research Portal tool. This is actually a relatively new function. We just revamped it um, at the end of the summer last year, and it's really great. So basically, this function is going to follow what you have set in your settings on, at the top of the red toolbar where my mouse is. So basically, it's going to show you any sort of broker research as well as Bloomberg research you have access to and it'll show you research specific for names in your portfolio. So you can really target the universe that you're looking at. What's good about all of you having a terminal account is the fact that you'll get access to some free broker research, which is pretty nice. Um, and you'll also get access to all the internal Bloomberg research as well. So if I click on settings here all the way at the top right, You'll notice that at the top, uh, there's a section called list where my mouse is, and there's a yellow bar uh, in there. I click on the yellow bar and I can go ahead and source, you know, any sort of security list or portfolio that I have on the terminal. Um, I can also source an index like the S&P 500, right? Any sort of generic security list you can source here. Um, so let me just pull up a portfolio that I have, so do this one. And then, Make sure you have my companies checked. The my companies section is gonna show you broker research and Bloomberg research for names in the list you just sourced. And then any other section you can check if you're interested in, learn, interested in this topic, right? So I have ESG checked because I'm interested in the uh, ESG space. And basically what this is gonna show me is gonna show me any sort of more like macro level research that has come out about the ESG space, right? So. Um, any other topics that you see here that you're interested in getting generic research for, you can go ahead and check. Once you have that done, hit save all the way at the top left, and then go back to the, we go back to the RES function. <clears throat> it's going to go ahead and show me, um, it's going to follow my settings, right? So the My Company section I can see here is showing me a couple of these different Mizuho research articles for different names in my portfolio list that I sourced. And then other beneath that, I have equity strategy, credit strategy, and ESG, and they are all showing me research, uh, more broad, broader level of research that fall under these topics that I can go ahead and read as well. So RES is a great function to get research on. So that's, that's the main research tool. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about news, actually. So we have a function called N. It's just a letter N, like Nancy, then hit enter. And this is going to be a really good function to run if you want to get news on your portfolio. So when you run the function N at the top in blue, it says pick a ticker list. 
you can click on that and then you can go ahead and source or you know source uh, any portfolio that you have set up on Bloomberg. And it's going to show you a uh, news feed uh, that'll show you news headlines for names uh, in your portfolio, right? Um, there's also a top ranked news section. It's gonna show me some like top headlines that have come out for names in my portfolio. And then on the bottom, it's gonna show me time ordered news. <clears throat> So N is a really good function to run to get news on your portfolio. Next, I want to talk a little bit about earnings events. So we have a function called EBT. Um, EBT is a way for you to keep track of company uh, earnings calls, earnings releases, uh, press conferences, uh, company presentations, and things like that. And basically, when you run EBT, just make sure you clear out of anything that already shows up here. Someone just takes it out of the blue. And then on the left hand side, there's a source button. You click on this with this gray source button and you can go ahead and source your portfolio, right? So I'm just go pick one of my portfolios, right? And now it's gonna show me for all the names in my portfolio, what company events are gonna be, are coming up, right? So we know that um, Disney's gonna have its Q2 uh, earnings call in on May 5th, right? So it's a good way to kind of keep track of events coming up. You can also go click into an event and actually just create an alert on that as well. So if you wanna get alerted about when this event is happening, you can do so through this EBT function. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the cool sort of news and social media analytical tools you can apply to your portfolio as well. We have a function called T-R-E-N, which stands for news trends. So T-R-E-N and then hit enter. And this is a really, really cool function because it uses Bloomberg's automation tools to put together these types of analytics. So when you run TREN, there is a security list button kind of where my mouse is. I'm gonna click on security list and then to the right hand side, there's a yellow box next to the word list. This is where you can go ahead and source a portfolio of your choice. Let's do a different one. Um, and basically this function is gonna show you a lot of cool things, right? Um, if I look at the news readership activity tab, this is gonna show me names in my security list that had a very big uh, news readership increase, which means a lot of people for some reason are clicking on news related to uh, Nexi and links, for example, right? Um, so these names in my portfolio have the largest increase in news readership activity. What's really, really cool is you can see the according price change today. Um, as well as the according news headline, right? Um, so you can actually click into each of these news headlines to actually read it. If I click on news sentiment, this is really cool because basically our, auto, our uh, AI is able to uh, basically tell me names in my portfolio that I've had a lot of negative news headlines coming out about them and also the names that have a lot of positive news that have come out you know, um, in the past eight hours. Um, you can see the eight hours is on the, the right hand side. We can always change your trend period if you want to. But this is really cool, right? So we have this, uh, uh, this uh, these two kind of like information technology companies right here. In my portfolio, I have a lot of negative news headlines that have come out about them. You can see the according negative news headline here on the right hand side. Um, same thing, we have a lot of securities that have a lot of positive news that have come out in the past eight hours too. You'll be able to track that through this function as well. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanna talk about the Twitter sentiment tab. So obviously we know that social media is just, has a huge impact, um, even on the markets. We've seen what happened with like Reddit and GameStop, right? Or Kylie Jenner can make a tweet about Snapchat and then two seconds later, Snapchat drops like 10%, for example, right? So social media and Twitter is a huge part. Uh, is something that Bloomberg really wanted to get involved with. So this Twitter sentiment tab actually has the ability <clears throat> for to, to basically show you what names in your portfolio have a lot of negative tweets about them and what names in your portfolio have a lot of positive tweets that have come out about them. Um, so for example, in my portfolio, these two uh, names had, have had a lot of positive tweets coming out about them and you can actually go ahead and click the representative tweet uh, that kind of showcases this uh, positive uh, social media sentiment here. Um, so it's super, super cool. Um, you can also track like news volume and Twitter volume and things like that as well. So that's all really cool. But yeah, that, this is the news trends and analytics function. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to Maya. Maya, if you want to talk about worksheets, the W function, um, as well as um, then start kind of going into some of the equity focused tools, um, that would be great. <clears throat> um, I'm going to have to hop off because of a, like a work call that I have to be on, but I'll be back in a little bit. Awesome. I will go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so I don't use the W function that often. I use it mostly when I'm setting up a new portfolio or switching coverage. Um, but you can just literally type in W for worksheet um, and come up here to create a new worksheet. Um, and so there's different formats that you can have it. Um, we have some suggested templates based on what your profession is, if you're a sell side analyst or a buy side analyst, etc. cetera. Um, but if you just select basic, create, um, and then you can either type in tickers here, um, or you can also, if you have like an Excel sheet um, where you created your portfolio of companies, you can always import that um, Excel sheet and create a worksheet that way. Um, I do view a worksheet every single day. I have a couple um, that you can pin to your launch pad, which is what you first see when you log into your terminal. Um, and so I mentioned earlier, I am a equity research data analyst. So I have like a portfolio of companies that I cover for like models, research, earnings, et cetera. Um, so I track on a very high level um, how they're doing every day. So whether it's by price, or in this worksheet over here, um, I have like volume and a couple of other metrics. Um, and then what's pretty timely, especially we're coming off the end of fourth quarter earnings season right now. Um, but I need to be prepared for companies to report earnings. So I track their expected report date and expected report time. So if it's a before market company reporting or after market, and this kind of helps me get prepared each day for what's going to be like noteworthy and timely. Um, I also have in my worksheet here, you can add in news events. So this will tell me, usually if the company is reporting that day, you're gonna have a really high volume of news events. And so JB Hunt already reported, but I can see there's been a lot of stuff about them in the news today. So I can always click on it and it will show me um, some of the items that were released recently. Um, so you can see J.B. Hunt reader interest increases. Um, so that is something I like to have set up in my launch pad every day. I also have, it's on my other screen, but I have um, an alert set up. So if you have like a portfolio in worksheet, um, you can come into NLRT and set up specific alerts. So like I have um, portfolio alerts set up that come to um, a little pop-up. I have them come to my phone if you have the Bloomberg app, email, et cetera. Um, and then I just have some like high, like top stories and political news and other big headlines just so I can stay up to date with news without always going and like reading full articles throughout the day. Um, I'd love to do that. That would just take up my entire day. But um, just some cool things that you can set up to kind of personalize your terminal experience. Um, I want to start um, kind of from the perspective of like equity research and analysis. Um, so I'm gonna start broad and kind of narrow in on specific companies and how to analyze a specific company's performance. Um, but first is the question of like, how do we pinpoint what company we want to research if we don't have one in mind already? Um, I'd say the best tool for this is EQS. Um, so that is our equity screening function. So you can just type in EQS, come to here, 
And so what this is defaulting to at first is it's looking at all actively traded companies. Um, and that is the universe we're starting with. And then we can filter down on this to get to a smaller group of companies. Um, so I'll revisit the screen in a little bit with some other specific examples, but um, Apple's a popular company. I'm sure you all know of Apple. Um, so we'll keep this company in mind, but let's say I know I want to look at companies in the United States. So their country of domicile is the US. So I clicked country of domicile, US, update. So that brought the number of companies in my screening down by a lot because it's not including all companies worldwide. Um, and now let's say Apple's a technology company. I wanna come into sectors here and I see technology and I can expand technology and drill down even deeper, like within software, you can go into application software. Um, and one thing I just wanna to touch on is all of these industry groupings, whether it's energy, financials, technology, the way that the industries are selected and created is through BICS. You can switch it, but BICS is the Bloomberg Industry Classification Standard. Um, so this is what Bloomberg Intelligence uses. This is what will be the default on a lot of these like peer related screens and functions. Um, VIX is very similar to NAICS codes, um, which is North American Industry Classification Standard. GIX, you may have heard of, Global Industry Classification Standard. Um, but we like VIX. And so there are multiple different levels to VIX, as you saw, where you can drill down. Um, but I'm going to start broad because you can always continue to layer on or edit and just do technology. So I have that selected and now I'm going to click update and that brought me down by a lot. So right now I'm looking at actively traded companies, the primary security, the country of domicile being the United States within the technology sector. So let's say I want to look at companies. This was more timely a couple months ago or actually a year ago now. That's crazy. Um, but companies that probably were impacted the most within the tech sector when COVID first hit in the APAC region, Asia Pacific. So these are US companies that have a high percentage of revenue coming from the APAC region. So to do that, um, you can just start typing in this amber box here. This is one of the things I like about EQS is you don't necessarily need to know what you're looking for yet. You can just start typing and things will auto-populate. So I wanna look at geographic segment revenue percent. So I come here and we have these pre-selected, you can drill down further, but I just wanna go broad Asia Pacific. Uh, so I'm gonna click update. And now I want to look at the top we're gonna do it by rank. So I wanna see the top 100 companies, higher is better, with the most exposure to the APAC region within the technology sector. So you can see that I have 100 matches now and that's because I didn't do like top 10%, I did top 100 companies um, by revenue percent coming from APAC. So now I can click um, see results. And you can, right now it's sorted high to low, but you can sort low to high. And you can see these are all US companies. Um, and there's also some other high level um, important data points that are in this sheet. Um, you also have the option to customize it even more. Um, so if you don't, I would highly suggest everyone explore our FLDS function, which is like our data field finder. So you can search for ratios here. You can search for fields. Like if you type revenue, a million things will come up. Um, but you can see like our field ID and the mnemonic here. Um, but this is a great way to like get a background of what fields are available. But let's say a certain 
ratio we don't have pre-built for you. You have the option to build it yourself. Um, and there's this little, this is the same thing as like fields here. You can like search it this way. Um, but let's say you wanna just like create an equation similar to how you would in Excel or anywhere else. Um, you can actually type one in here. And so let's say I wanna look at pre-tax income margin. So I know these fields off the top of my head, but if you didn't, you can always search up here. But I want to look at pre-tax income, which is a field RR001 is the field ID. Um, and you can kind of see like a description and example for how to create your own custom fields down here with like the dollar sign and everything um, divided by ISO 10, which is revenue. And then times 100. So let's click save and use. click enter and we're just going to display it. We're not going to filter down by it. You could, if you wanted to. And we have it here, our custom formula. So we can always sort on it. Um, high to low, low to high. Um, and you can then export this if you'd like and do some more analysis or create a worksheet from here. Um, so EQS is a great way to kind of get familiar with the different players within a specific industry or um, filter down to a specific list based on criteria. Um, some other functions that I really like for peer analysis and understanding the players in a specific market are drive is cool. It's very high level. Um, and so let's see. It gives you very high level things like sales surprise, and I'll touch on surprise in a little bit. Um, different profitability ratios and leverage ratios. Um, and it's just a very high level picture in comparison to peers. Um, if we want to specifically drill down and compare on a metric by metric basis with peers, I really like the relative valuation function, RV. So you come here and you see peers listed below. And then right now we're just in a high level overview view. Um, but these are some like key metrics that we look at. Um, you'll notice that we have two peers listed here. And that is because when you go to um, RV, it usually defaults to analyst curated Bloomberg intelligence peers. So this is what the Bloomberg intelligence analyst um, is looking at for Apple in comparison to other mobile handset manufacturers. So this is what they're doing their analysis on. This is what a lot of other equity research um, analysts are looking at in terms of these peers. You can always swap it if you'd like or um, create your own peer group. Let's say maybe the one that you found through EQS. Um, and then we have, you can go into like profitability and look at key profitability metrics. You can create custom and add new fields that way. It's gonna be that same field search here. Um, and we can go to our custom field that we just created and add that in as well. Um, so RV is probably my favorite place for getting a great understanding before I start diving into analyzing one company specifically. Um, and I'll move on to that next. Feel free to stop me if anyone has any questions. But okay, so I will start off with the FA function for financial analysis. Um, this is the function that like my team primarily supports. Um, and this is company reported data. So if you think about like 10 Ks and 10 Qs, I'm sure you've seen a couple of them or at least heard of what a 10 K or 10 Q is. 
Um, but for US companies, they file, for public US companies, they file these financial documents um, quarterly and annually through the SEC. Um, it's called the SEC Edgar feed is how we get that, those documents directly. Um, but what we do is we take those documents and we capture company reported data points. So this is just like our key stats, really great high level snapshot. Um, but then you can drill down into like the income statement, the balance sheet, um, where is, we had a cool one. I don't know where it is. I'll find it later, but we had a, we have like a COVID. We created a bunch of fields for COVID-19 to analyze the impact of COVID-19. Um, I'm curious where it is, but um, we also have segments here. And so company segments are a great way to get a snapshot of how a company operates, what their products or services are, um, their geographic impact. Um, you'll notice that like there are some blanks here and that's because over time a company may reclassify their segments or change their structure. Um, so for existence, Apple doesn't report Japan uh, they do. That's a bad example. Apple doesn't um, report the difference between like iPod and iTunes software and service revenue anymore. Um, but this is a great way to like understand how the company operates. Um, you can also build custom displays, very similar to like with EQS. Um, you can search by fields. You can save these displays, um, like I cover airlines, so none of this should work, but I have a custom display of all like specific industry related airline metrics. Um, so this is the focus on company reported data. So how they've done historically in the past and over time. Transitioning a little bit to forward looking and how the street thinks that a company is gonna perform, we're going to look at some of our earnings estimates related functions. So I like to usually just start at earn, E-R-N for earnings history. And so this is a very like high level, um, it shows you for Apple, we are looking at, so we have like our period dates here. Um, you'll notice that Apple has a, they're not on a normal fiscal year end. Um, so it's not going to be the same as the calendar year. So they just reported 2021 Q1 versus a lot of other companies that follow the fiscal calendar year. They just reported Q4 2020. Um, but what this is looking at is these are future upcoming periods. And this is how the street thinks that Apple is going to make have for EPS. Um, this, when I say the street, we have different brokers that contribute their research models. Um, we aggregate the estimates for each broker to create like an average consensus value. Um, we, for reported periods where we had like a FA period with historical data, we like to compare how the company like reported so the actual reported value against how the street thought they would do up until they reported that period. And so we take those two values and we calculate a surprise. So you can see for EPS for this past quarter, um, Apple beat estimates with an 18.5% surprise for earnings per share. Um, so you may have heard that terminology of like beat or misses estimates. Um, and this is where it comes from. And you can switch the metric that you're looking at. There's also um, guidance here, for example. So we have the reported data, we have what the street thinks a company will do in advance of reporting earnings. And then we have guidance, which is how the company thinks they're going to do prior to that reporting period. So it usually happens in like a annual period a company will in their analyst earnings call or in their press release, they'll give some sort of 
guidance or information on how they would expect their revenue to be next period or next year. Um, in the past couple of months, we've actually seen the highest number of retractions of guidance. Um, and this is like, I forget the exact statistic, but it used to be something like we maybe saw 15 retractions over the past like two years. And then in the past like three quarters, we've seen like over a thousand retractions. And this is because of all the instability in the market with COVID-19, the election and everything else. Um, so you won't always see guidance now. Um, looking at another function, we have EEO, which is similar. It just gives a different view kind of, uh, more of a breakdown of multiple metrics that you can view at the same time. Um, you guys may have seen MODL. So MODL is looking at um, consensus values and specific brokers. And then um, Kofi is something I'm really excited to show all of you. I think if some of you type it in now, it may like give you a pop up saying, do you want to opt into this? Um, feel free to say yes. If you don't see that, we can talk to your rep and make give you guys access. Um, but Kofi is bringing together our um, forward-looking estimates and our actual like company reported data. So you saw before you saw surprise um, for a lot of um, like EPS and revenue, like very top line metrics. But now we can see, um, if I change this to last quarter, for example, um, you can see that we have surprise for like more company specific things like um, revenue from Japan. Um, we now have surprise on that versus just like total revenue. If we look in the multiple period, <laughs> sorry. Um, I live in the city, so it can be loud sometimes, but um, looking here, I think this is super awesome because as an analyst, I often found myself going to MODL for one thing, going to FA for another thing. Um, and so here I can actually see like this view has 2018 Q2 through 2021 Q1, um, the reported segment revenue by product for Apple. But now I can actually see like what the street thinks um, service revenue is going to be next quarter, the quarter after. Um, we can go over a little bit and see like what it's going to be for the next few quarters. Um, and we have this like not only for like segment breakdown, but we now have this on a line item basis for like the income statement, um, the balance sheet, the cash flow. Um, so this is a lot more detail than you would have ever gotten on something like earn and just see surprise. Um, one thing to note is, for example, these little grayed out numbers here, um, like this five, for example, this means that there are five sell side analysts contrib like estimating um, cost of revenue for the service segment. Um, so versus you see 28 here. So we have 28 analysts contributing to the consensus estimate for total revenue. That's because like almost every, well, every single model for Apple will probably have revenue, total revenue versus not every model might model out the individual components for the segments. Um, so that just shows you how many brokers are contributing to this. Um, so this Kofi company financials um, function is new, um, but so far it's been extremely helpful um, in connecting our earnings and estimates and fundamentals data. Um, I want to touch a little bit on research and Bloomberg intelligence. Um, so for, I think it's like 5,000 companies, our Bloomberg Intelligence covered. So Bloomberg Intelligence is our like equity research. 
Um, and so I can type in BICO. So it's the Bloomberg Intelligence Primer on any ticker. Some tickers are obviously not covered, um, but Apple definitely is. And so it brings us to um, some written research. So there's company outlook for future periods, thinking how a company is gonna perform. And then we have financial review, which is after the company reports and how they did. Um, so this is uh, usually like my next step when it comes to, so first you start broad with EQS, relative value, understand the players and the peers, um, understand the company's performance itself, and then dive into some actual research. Um, you can also come over to the company earnings analyzer. Um, and this will, so like on FA and on Kofi, like there's a lot of data there. Um, we're Bloomberg, we run on data. And so one of the nice things about these company earnings analyzers is this is what BI is deeming as most important for their company outlooks and for analyzing their companies. So, I mean, you will see like the, the segment breakdown, the income statement, um, a lot of this will be the same as what you see on FA, but sometimes there may be some like super company specific type metrics at the top, like global smartphones, um, market value, 30, um, 31% uh, market share for iOS. Um, so some really good industry specific type data. Another thing um, that's kind of new is we like Bloomberg intelligence is broken apart based on like industry in this example. So this is tech, um, but we also have like broader topics about the market. So if we go to BI market vault, this is going to bring us to um, a data portal for retail brokers. So I mentioned a little bit earlier with the SEC Edgar feed that for US public companies, they have to file like quarterly and annual 10 Qs and 10 Ks through the SEC. So we get their data that way. For private companies, it's different. Some of them disclose it on their company website, some don't disclose it at all. But if you're a retail broker, whether you're public or private, you have to file what's called a 606 brokerage report that goes over like trade execution volumes and orders um, on a monthly basis. So what's been, we did this a couple months ago um, and it's been super timely now is for all of the big retail brokers, um, we can see like total payments, we can see total shares and contracts executed um, which has been really cool because you take something like Robinhood and you've probably heard them in the news recently and we can see that over time um, total shares and contracts executed for Robinhood has in oh, wait for this to load but it has um, increased throughout the pandemic as more like retail investors get involved um, in the market. So that's been really cool to see. Um, kind of, there's also like really great market commentary and research here. So if we look at volume trends, um, the Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst has done like a lot of research, especially recently, like talking about GameStop specifically. Um, so this is a great place to come to learn about everything going on right now in the market. Um, I actually want to revisit EQS for a moment in connection to this, um, because I personally use EQS more so from like a equity peer analysis perspective, um, but there are other ways to use it. So let's say you wanna find the next GameStop. Um, you can come and filter down based on similar criteria. So if I go country of domicile, I just wanna look in North America. Um, I then I'm going to, like I said, there's a ton of stuff to explore for criteria. Um, you just kind of stumble upon these things. 
but I'm gonna search for short interest as a percent of equity. Um, and I'm going to do greater than or equal to 30%. And now I'm going to, oh, actually, I wanted to add one more thing. Options available. Every time I do this, I do this exact same example and I never hit enter. Now let's look. So what we're looking at are companies with at least 30% of the current free float um, that has been shorted. So like we can see GameStop up here. We can see AMC. Um, we see Dillard's. So this is just a, another cool way to utilize EQS um, in if you're trying to find the next GameStop. Um, a couple things I just want to touch on that aren't really related um, to equity analysis necessarily but some cool new functions. Um, so last semester, trimester, um, we showed the COVID virus map. Um, so let's see, actually, virus. We've updated it slightly now. So like you can look at percent vaccinated for specific countries. So like if you look at Israel, which has been making headways recently for um, how much of their population has been vaccinated and you can switch it from heat map to bubbles. Um, so this is a pretty cool thing to look at. Um, another more timely one, and this doesn't have as cool of a short function. So you type G pound maps 292. Maybe they should turn this into an actual like function. Um, so you search that and that's going to bring up the state of Texas on a map. And so this is looking at um, power plants. And you can see like by sector, if it's a nuclear, natural gas, coal, et cetera, um, their status, if they're operational right now. And then also the temperatures in the different areas within Texas. Um, so if you've been following the news recently, um, Texas has had record breaking um, freeze, freezing temperatures. And so here you can come and look at the energy market within Texas and how it's been impacted by these temperatures. Um, so that's one of the really cool things about maps is you literally, we have so many different data sets that you can graph on here. Um, and we have like suggested data down here. You can continue to layer things on. So if I wanted to, um, oops, I just wanted to see. You can look like I could have, if I wanted to layer down or layer on like COVID-19 cases within Texas. Um, so again, that is just cause it's not as catchy. G maps um, 292. Um, so I don't know if, Freya, are you back yet? No, okay. Um, so I can touch on a couple more things. I could keep talking as long as you'll let me. Um, no, but we have some really cool like graphing tools. So this is map. Um, we have, so if you go to G, this just takes you to like your library of graphs and charts. So like I work closely with our news team to look at um, during earnings season, how different companies are performing. So I created this um, graph that looks at rideshare for Lyft and Uber. 
Um, so you can see over time and right when the pandemic hit that they ha started having negative ride share growth. Um, so less and less people were using um, ride sharing as stay at home orders persisted. Um, there's also this one I think is kind of funny because I totally feed into this. Um, let's see. So this is looking at just for Uber because Uber discloses um, Uber Eats and Uber ride sharing bookings and revenue. And this is looking at when the pandemic hit, ride sharing obviously contracted. It's starting to get a little bit better, but it's still down negative 50% year over year. While at the same time, Uber Eats is really taken off during the pandemic as more and more people obviously aren't going to restaurants, um, but they are ordering in. So I am definitely a statistic in here. Um, but there's really cool ways that you can edit charts, personalize them. Um, you can change the, um, let's see. You can change the style. So if I wanted to look at like a histogram, um, you can also add news headlines or news sentiment to this. Um, oh, actually, I just want to add Uber price and then news sentiment. Um, this is a quarterly graph, um, but there's tons of stuff that you can do with graphs. You can also do custom indices or custom time series. Um, so oftentimes, like if the company hasn't reported yet and I'm creating a graph for what I think is going to happen, I can plug in the numbers on my own or import them from Excel. Um, I've been showing you a couple graphs that I've made for what events we call T Live. It's another news source. Um, so for during earnings season, we have T Live events where it's kind of like live blogs that um, journalists are adding to throughout the day, throughout the earnings call and the earnings release. Um, you can look at like a past one, for example. We don't just do it for earnings, we do it for pretty much any like highly anticipated events. So we did it for the um, hearing last week about GameStop. Um, usually there's graphs if it's like earnings season, um, but it gives you like a really great high level um, play by play if you want, or you can always go to like CN for company news if it's about a specific company um, or top I think Freya already showed you, which is the top news each day. Um, Daybreak is personally the way that I start my day. Um, and it's just a great way to get kind of what's going on in the markets today. Um, we also have, um, let's see how I get here. Um, Bloomberg brief newsletters. Um, I got these before I ever started working at Bloomberg. Um, you can do it on like the Bloomberg website as well. Um, but it's just like sometimes they're daily newsletters, sometimes they're weekly newsletters, and you can do it for different topics such as like, there's a five things to start your day one, there's a Bloomberg economics one, there's the ESG one. Um, ESG is another hot topic right now, as it should be. Um, and so ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance. And Bloomberg has our own um, special like ESG indices. And we collect a lot of data from company like annual reports and specific ESG reports. Um, and we get companies to give us this data as well. Um, to give our own comprehensive ESG disclosure score. 
Um, a couple other companies like S&P Global have their own scores as well and Sustainalytics. But we recently in the past like two quarters, I think, started um, our creation of our own ESG disclosure score. So just a cool thing to touch on there. Um, I think we have some time for questions. Um, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask or see more of. I had a quick question. If yes. that's okay. Um, I'm a very visual person, so I really like your graphing function. Um, but I was wondering if you could drill down a little bit into the technical indicators that we might have access to in terms of maybe like throwing on regression lines or basic moving averages. And then I was wondering if there was an easy way to compare two graphs without creating a whole new tab um, and bouncing back and forth between two screens. Yeah, let me go to the intraday price chart, for example. Um, so unfortunately Freya is out at the moment, but um, she is our technical analysis expert. Um, but there are tons of ways to add different data sets and layer them on with each other. So you don't have to just like create two separate graphs. Um, you can also, um, like, let's say I want to look at volume and you can look at the simple moving average for volume. Um, so you can choose any of these different studies here. Um, so I know Freya usually likes to look at Bollinger Bands. Um, and you can continue to layer on that way. Um, you can also change like the time frame. So you can put like in a five year span and continue to layer on metrics. And you can always edit like each metric here and look at the data series. Um, you can also change the like axes. So you could normalize it all on the same axes or have it on separate depending on the um, metrics that you're comparing side by side. And then as Freya showed earlier, you can also add in like key events um, to see some like, like I'm sure if we look at this for, oh shoot. <laughs> I always click that button and it takes me to automated news. Um, Let's see. Like if we come here and we click key events, we look at a five year timeline. I mean, you'll obviously see that price got pretty crazy recently, but like if we look in the past one month, we can see like what key news events have occurred. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of different ways to customize it and add some technical analysis as well. Any other questions? Sorry about the noise. <laughs> Well, I have to say this has been outstanding again. Uh, learned even more in this section versus the last. There's just so much here. And, and so I really appreciate the, uh, the detail that you guys have done as well as the opportunity uh, that Jordan shared uh, with working with Bloomberg uh, going forward. So if no one does have any other questions, then I will let uh, everyone go and I'll let our, our Bloomberg guests uh, are around. If you wanna reach out to them individually uh, for additional information, please feel free. But again, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> team at Bloomberg. 
uh, for your presentation. Really appreciate what you guys did today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. All right, you guys get a couple minute break. And again, I'll, I'll see you at the, the next section. Zoom. Sounds good, thank you. All right, see you in a few, thanks. Bye-bye.